And welcome to this special live episode of The Dental Guys, streaming live on Facebook, Spear Education, The Dental Guys, also YouTube. We really appreciate you joining us for this special live Facebook expanding, right, on what we've talked about before and airway and orthodontics. John, welcome to the show. Yeah, John, The Dental Guy, I'm excited to be here. Um, I'm, I'm kind of glad, I mean... We're gonna have tons more stuff on business and you know uh, PPE, you know. But I'm really excited. This is really what we love doing is talking clinical. And this is there's it. Nobody, there's nobody that I'd rather be talking to today about this topic than who we have with us. Doctor mm. Rebecca Bachau is back with us. Thank you for coming back on the show. We're so excited to have you back. Thank you guys for having me. Yeah, I mean, last time we really started to get into this topic, and I felt like we, we, I mean, we had we covered a lot of good ground, really trying to more establish sort of the idea behind how we evaluate uh, airway and orthodontics, but we didn't get into a lot of treatment and treatment options. And so I think that's one thing I'm excited about today. Um, talk a little bit about because we're going to be using this as kind of a framework for today to kind of dive right in. Talk a little bit about the white paper that you developed along with Spear Education for the transverse dimension. You know, tell us a little bit about what that is. Um, why, why did you do that? Uh, why, why did you develop that? And uh, start talking a little bit about what is that transverse dimension? Why is it important? Sure. So it all it all probably originated because so my background I I started out. Uh, practicing restorative dentistry. And if we think about the records that we take and we think about, and in orthodontics as well, we look at the profile from the side, we look at vertical dimensions, and those all can be gleaned from a lateral ceph. And and we, we look at the teeth retracted. We generally don't think about the transverse dimension, but if we really stop and think about it, it has everything to do with number one airway, and we'll talk about that, but it also has to do with periodontal issues because imagine if the teeth are tipped in, that's going to affect the periodontium, especially on the buccal surfaces of the teeth. It's going to affect occlusal load. So especially when we start thinking about restorative dentistry, implant dentistry, if the, the tooth is loaded on its long ax, off of its long axis, that's going to change our uh, mechanics and it, and it changes the way we clean teeth. So it has everything to do with everyone when we think about the transverse. So I wanted to put together a lot of that information and introduce it in a very, hopefully an easy to understand way. Um, I think uh, we can talk about as we get into this a little bit more, how we actually diagnose it and then also how we treat it. But, but that was sort of the origin for the, that paper. Yeah. So let's talk about the, how, how do we, diagnose a discrepancy or a deficiency in that transverse dimension because you know as you say as we start thinking about that and looking at that there's some clinical things we can do there's some radiographic things we can do um, talk a little bit about that and, and and also on some of the uh, maybe the literature that supports what is a deficiency and how do we know that it is deficiency based upon what we know from literature Sure. Well, um, do you think I could share my screen? I it, maybe um, some case examples would be easier. Yeah, so if, you're up. If and we going. look here, thanks, guys. Um, so what, we're going to open up some slides here. Um, we'll keep we'll keep this a little informal, just sort of looking at at some different pictures here. But this is I really want to show this because it shows three different patients, and they all have a transverse issue but it might not necessarily be something that we look at. So this patient right here, we see the, the unilateral crossbite. She's missing lateral incisors, so we know she's narrow. If we look here, we have a double crossbite. We know that's narrow. But then what about this patient right here? Well, we don't see a crossbite, but if we look carefully, we see that these teeth are all tipped in. And I'll tell you that this patient also has bilateral impacted canines. Impacted canines are a sign that the maxilla is narrow because there's not enough room for the adult teeth to come in. So this we have a special name for, and these are the really tricky ones. And, and the literature calls this bimaxillary convergence. So I'll, I'll click over to here so that we can all look at normal. So normal here, 
um, as I alluded to earlier, you see that the teeth are upright in the bone. We don't have that extreme lingual inclination. And if we have the teeth upright in the bone, we're going to have healthy periodontium and healthy occlusal load. And notice there's no wear here. So nice soft tissue. But I want to introduce this concept of bimaxillary convergence. So I'll show you guys. Um, so just some other examples. These are all examples of a, of a transverse issue. Notice here a lot of times we have this compensation on the lower arch, and that's something that we'll want to address as well. So this patient has double crossbites, but it's hard to pick up origin initially because we see this ex extreme lingual inclination. So what I want us all to look at is not where the teeth are, but where the bone is. So if we watch the mucogingival junction here, we get a better appreciation for how narrow this is. Mm -hmm. So if we look, this is this idea of bimaxillary convergence. So notice we have the ideal here. We have teeth in the bone and the palatal cusps rest in the central fossa, top and bottom. If we have this bimaxillary convergence, you see that we, we have this narrowing of the arches in the absence of a crossbite, and that's the tricky one. And so um, we'll talk about how we diagnose this. But so if we look here, this would be our ideal. And we have clinically no crossbite. And in the CBCT, we have the teeth centered in the bone and they're upright here. If we look at this picture here, this is what we would call mm. bimaxillary convergent. So clinically, these are really tricky. Um, we see that there's no crossbite, but let's look at that CBCT and you get a sense of the extreme lingual inclination of those lower teeth. And um, what's interesting in this picture too, and the authors, this is from a paper published um, in 2012. The author's name is Minor. Um, and this is in the orthodontic literature. So this is in the AJODO. And um, notice here the tongue can't fill that oral cavity. So we'll talk about how this is, plays an important role in airway. But when we think about airway, we want to make room for the tongue. Um, we'll also see, you'll see this more and more clinically if you look at CBCTs, but when you have a narrow maxilla, you also often have narrow nasal passages. So um, the next question um, you guys might want to ask is, does everybody need a CBCT to make this diagnosis? And I would yeah, say yeah. no. <clears throat> Well, let's just wait just a second here because this right here is next level already, okay? Because yep. what you've shown for the clinicians is a different way of looking at patients already, okay? We've described just a physical without even looking at that shot, which I love the CBCT uh, mm -hmm. uh, shot that you gave right there. That has really changed my practice because mm -hmm. of that I can confirm what I'm seeing. So you shoot, showed some really good clinical examples there. And I think to begin to recognize as a dentist, John, one of the things that you and I came back whenever we started looking at uh, patients that were at risk of transverse dimension deficiencies, right? We started looking at this lingually inclined mandibular molar and the mm -hmm. lingually inclined maxillary molar. And, and then from there, we started thinking about, is there a role in the muscles and how the face formed as a child? Because we're looking here, Rebecca, we're looking at... These are, these are adolescents and adult patients for the most part. We're not looking at mixed dentition patients here. We're looking at 12, 13, and 14-year-olds whenever we have to make really tough decisions, right? And so mm -hmm. I think that what you've shown is amazing because it's an eye-opening thing for a lot yeah. of our listeners. John? But, but, do, but I think that that next question that you're bringing us to is the question that uh, it's not a new question uh, about should we, when should we take CBCTs? And we actually talked to you a couple of years ago at Spear Summit, and mm -hmm. uh, that was, it seemed like it was fresh information then, uh, but it's, 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 so it's been around a while, but, but yeah. uh, address that. Cause I think a lot, there's still a lot of discussion uh, slash controversy about whether or not we should be taking CBCTs in our mixed mm -hmm. dentition patients or how low do you go? Um, and, and what, and, and what's the benefit, you know, that we're seeing. So, so yeah, address that. I think that's just where you were going. So get, if you want to, we'll pop your slides back up there and you can, uh, kind of keep going, well, going down that you know, road. So yeah, let's talk about that because so when we think about an airway issue, when we think about a sleep issue in a child or an adult, 
I'll tell you, if we use the pediatric sleep questionnaire, if we use our health history form, I have a good sense of their some of their issues before I've looked at any sort of radiograph. And then we can mm -hmm. look in the mouth and we get a really good picture of what's going on. By the time I get to the CBCT, I'm confirming what I see. I don't need it to make the diagnosis in almost all instances. Um, the, the exceptions might be if we're looking at nasal and maxillary anatomy and if we're looking for impacted teeth. Those are some of the times when I would really, really want a CBCT. The other thing that we, so we'll talk about what we can see in a CBCT. Um, in a CBCT, we can see nasal restriction in a much better way than we can see um, looking at the patient. We can look at if there's a narrowing at the adenoids and we can look at the extent of the narrowing where the tonsils are. We also get a sense of where the blockage is. Is the blockage up high or is it down low? Is it in the is it in the upper pharyngeal airway where the adenoids meet the soft palate, or is it deep at the base of the tongue? Okay, we now, also let's, can let's get a hold on just a second here because that all I want to interrupt again because here's yeah. the thing: what you're talking about is a lot of medical knowledge. And so one of the mm -hmm. things that John and I immediately did whenever we started talking about nasopharyngeal spaces and anatomy that you start looking at, it, turbinates that are enlarged or some kind of offset sinus that looks odd, what you need to do, and I think too, is educate yourself or go find somebody like a pediatric ENT like we have mm -hmm. or an adult ENT that sees peds because it will help mm -hmm. you. And um, that's one of the things that we run up against is because when we started looking at no noses, right? I mean, like to tell a dental patient, I mean, like every single time I tip their nose up and I'm looking up into their nose physically, just that alone, when you start doing that on hundreds of patients, you begin mm -hmm. to appreciate what you see on a CBCT. Yeah. And, and you're that's teaching very that. True. Uh, and you're teaching that kind of thing too. I mean, talk about that before we go on into the showing, because I want to show, obviously we're going to show that, but when, when people come out to hear you speak, um, mm -hmm. about these topics, um, how far into that anatomy lesson do you go as far as identification, or is it really something that people need to go take maybe a CBCT specific course on identifying these things an abnormal mm -hmm. versus normal, you know, how much can they get say at spear, uh, how much do they need to go and, and take like an AOMR type of case, you know, or, or mm -hmm. type of uh, class? Well, I, you know, I think that in our, we're going to, this new spear course that we're putting together be pretty amazing. Um, we launch in two weeks. Um, and, uh, Dr. Gunson, Mike Gunson and I have been looking at this material pretty much nightly. And he, he and I are really going to go into how do we look at faces? How do we diagnose mm -hmm. um, a, a skeletal growth issue? And he, he's going to really talk a lot about the importance of record taking. And we're not going to get into the specifics of how to read a CBCT, but I think you'll you'll leave that with a global understanding of what's normal and what's abnormal, we need especially this so as bad. it pertains to the face. Mm -hmm. Okay. So good. Okay. Yeah. And, and you said too, um, and I want to let you kind of get, go into this a little bit more. You said you don't need CBCT in a lot of these cases. Okay. But that begs the question, are you still taking one? even though you may not need it, right, for the, for, because if you understand the facial anatomy and, you know, some of the measurements and things, but are mm -hmm. you, are you, are you typically still routinely taking those for the, the, the idea of say tracking growth or, you know, looking for pathology uh, that you might not be able to see with a clinical exam? So today in my practice, we are taking them, but we didn't used to. Um, there was a, a pretty amazing symposium that happened yesterday um, through the AAPMD on nasal breathing. And one mm. of the physicians was showing that if you do nasal surgery and you convert a patient from a mouth breather to a nasal breather, the pharyngeal airway opens, which is crazy. Mm. Mm. And, and we're seeing that routinely with our expansion cases. So, um, we have families, for example, that don't want to take out adenoids and tonsils as a first line. If we can do expansion 
And if we can convert these patients from mouth breathers to nasal breathers because we've opened up nasal passages, as we create space for the tongue, we see that the tongue, the resting tongue posture autocorrects. It comes forward and there's literature to back this up. What we see routinely is pharyngeal airway opens and the, and then adenoids shrink and tonsils shrink. I will hmm. never promise a patient that that's going to happen. I would say we see it probably 60% of the time. Uh, but if we're trying to be conservative and avoid elective surgeries, which especially given COVID today, I think this is a great yeah. option. Yeah. Um, yeah. If we can get a patient to breathe through their nose, we see that the airway will improve. So going back to your question, what do we look at in a CBCT? Um, I'm looking at nasal passage deviations. I'm looking at the blockage between the soft palate and the adenoids. I'm looking at how does the tongue fill the oral cavity and I'm looking at the posterior pharyngeal airway space. Mm -hmm. CBCTs are not considered diagnostic for airway issues, That's right. um, but they That's give us a snapshot. Mm -hmm. um, we want to try to standardize number one patient posture. So we want them upright in what's called a natural head posture. So mm -hmm. especially airway patients, they'll cheat. Um, and or if it's your staff positioning the patient in the in the x-ray, they, they need to know how to position that patient because that's going to change where the tongue posture is and it's going to change what your airway looks like. Because yeah. remember, the now, airway is all soft tissue. Now, you said something a moment ago that I think is going to help us to lead into some of the next part of the show uh, that we've talked about is uh, you, you said that based on the symposium that if you're doing expansion – that you're seeing autocorrection was the word that I think you use of tongue posture um, and you're seeing tonsils and adenoids shrinking is that so when you say autocorrection you mean without myofunctional therapy that this is something that's done simply through expansion alone and and, and I think that'll get us into talking about expansion but but is that what you mean by that autocorrection yep so I can show you, I know we're sharing slides here. I've got another slide pulled up here with, um, cause you, I know we wanted to try to use some, pull some stuff from the literature here. So um, this paper, this is all they did, 2013 paper, they did expansion and they saw auto correction of the tongue posture. And by doing that, what happens is it opens up the pharyngeal airway space because the tongue comes up and forward. And, and I can show you other cases where we saw, I'll show it just because we talked about it a second ago. I want to show you a case where adenoids shrunk um, just from mm -hmm. doing the expansion alone. Bear with me here while I scroll to the end as prediction. Um, here we go. So this young woman um, came to us and I'll show you her lateral ceph. What we're looking at here, these are the adenoids and they're encroaching very close to the soft palate. Now, I, I mentioned posture. Do you see how she's craning her neck here? This is mm -hmm. a common thing for a small mandible patient to do. Um, this patient has a lower lip entrapment and a small mandible. So she's forced to be a, um, a mouth breather because she can't close her lips. I'll, I'll go back to her, her, her photos here. So she can't keep her lips together. And, and it's her lower lip entrapment is preventing her chin from growing forward. So we did our intervention. And um, you can see here in 10 months, and I'm clicking over there, but I think I'm running a lot of stuff here. So um, <laughs> if we look at the before and after lateral cephs, I didn't, my, it's, we sent her to a radiology center. This was before we got our CBCT. So she, she's sitting upright all on her own without any prompting. But notice now that she can keep her lips together, she has converted to a nasal breather and look at what happened to the adenoids. Unbelievable. Hmm. So wow. this is something that we see on a pretty regular basis. Um, if we think about the nose, the nose is a natural filtration system. And so if we can get these patients to be more nasal breathers, we're going to see that the, that tissue will shrink. Uh, you know, I'll interrupt here just for a second again. I like to interrupt, especially when I agree with someone, <laughs> right? Because I'm telling you what she's saying is true because, you know, John knows this, that I dove in super deep sent one of my girls to become a myofunctional therapist, but not only that, she was trained in nasal breathing re-education. And why? Amazing. Because when, when we see 
any nasal breathing issues in East Tennessee, it's because the the hypertrophy of the of the turbinates, or they can't and they can't breathe through their nose, so their mouth breathing, their tongue posture drops down, like Rebecca's talking about. And then on top of that, if we get their turbinates to shrink with the help of an ear, nose, and throat doctor or with allergy medicine or things like that, and they do shut their mouth, and we do encourage nasal breathing, we do see autocorrection. And a lot of times they don't even need myofunctional therapy. They don't need myobrace or whatever you might have. Um, it, it really is true, and I'll let Rebecca continue as I've yeah, that's pretty. Again. That's that's an important thing to, to hit because I think that the question of surgery – versus expansion is kind of what we're talking about here you know right. and and i think that there's a lot there there's been a lot of uh kind of discussion back and forth on that depending on who you are and you know some ents are fans of that of doing more surgery some are actually very nervous about doing more surgery um and so when you hear this it changes kind of the way we think about um how we would approach these patients that it might be expansion first versus surgery first now just and i know we're going to get a little high weeds here but how what would be the type of patient that you would say surgery first then if if you're seeing you know if the literature supports this idea of which it clearly does of autocorrection in these types of patients which patients then would you be thinking the ent needs to be first with uh tonsils and adenoid surgery versus expansion uh, and see what happens it's a great question um, well, I'll say clinically, I see better changes in the adenoids than the tonsils. I don't know why. Um, so if they have got huge tonsils, I might be more inclined to take those out first. I think for a younger patient, three, four, um, taking out adenoids and tonsils is a great first step. And then working on that re-education, working on breathing with lips together, working on tongue posture. And then we come back and expand when they're seven six or seven. Um, I can show you a case if, if we're, if we want to keep sharing cases of a patient that we really needed to take them out because there was it. such, such a blockage. Yeah. I'll show it. Um, so here we'll go back to, so this young man was an eight year old patient. And if we look here at his photos, um, he, we looked at this briefly earlier, but you see that lingual inclination here. I will tell you radiographically, seven and 10 are present, as is 22. We just don't have room for them. And so this is the kind of patient that you wanna take a closer look. And you see here just how small his maxilla is. Mm. If we look clinically, we see this. Wow. Mm -hmm. And this is a common thing for us to see in our practice. We often are the first people to talk to the families about adenoids and tonsils. I think a lot of pediatricians are hesitant to act on this, and a lot of ENTs in a lot of our communities will recommend Flonase before they take out tonsils. Um, That's right. If man. we look at the, we talked about what this looks like in a CBCT, so I'll give you guys a, a short course on anatomy here. These are the adenoids, and I highlighted them here, and it's very rare for them to actually touch the soft palate. Now notice his tongue posture is down, and notice his lips are apart. So a CBCT takes eight seconds and he could not breathe with his lips together for eight seconds. Absolutely cannot. So he's constantly mouth breathing. And if we look here, normally this should look like a kidney bean. So the two things I'm seeing here, number one, the tonsils are coming in from both sides and he's flexing his pharyngeal mm -hmm. airway muscles. He doesn't look know it, he's not doing too. it on purpose. Yeah. Yep. There's, so there's, this should not be open in this dimension. So he's struggling to breathe. And if we look here, there's not enough room for his tongue. That's right. And so with this young man, the first thing we did was we got adenoids and tonsils out. Mm -hmm. Now I'll show you as well our treatment because this might be a little controversial. So um, we, this happens to be a bonded expander, which tends to be a nice uh, appliance for a younger kid. Um, today, I probably would have used a Hyrax expander, but so here's a bonded expander and we did one round and each, each um, appliance opens up to about 11 millimeters at the jack screw level. If we think about the center of resistance for a maxilla, it's probably somewhere up in the middle of the nose. Let me click back for just a second. So if our appliance is here and our jack screw is here, 
the center of resistance is here. And so expansion is pyramidal. And so we're going to see a bigger opening. So we're going to see any sometimes up to 60% tipping. So we're if we open up a jack screw to 11 millimeters, that doesn't mean we're opening the suture to 11 millimeters. And that's an important thing to differentiate. And so we opened the first expander up all the way. And when we did that, we were still deficient. So this is the second expander. So it took us mm. two rounds of maxillary expansion until we had room for the lateral incisors. You can see even mm. here, it, it, I was a little nervous. It looked like we were a little shy. So here he is after, after two rounds of upper and lower expansion. No braces have been placed here, not, not a single nice. bracket. But if you get the bones in the right place, you get the teeth in the right place. Now, why do you say that um, that's potentially controversial? Is it because of the two rounds or talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So there's two, the two things that I would say are controversial about this case in the orthodontic world. Um, first, a lot of orthodontists will do one expander and they, and they're done. Um, in, in my practice, we expand until the bones are right. So if we need one and a half expanders if we need two or three expanders we'll do what it takes until we correct that that craniofacial deficiency the other gotcha. important key for him now in order to do that we have to upright the lower teeth and that's another controversial component in orthodontics um, in the 60s or 70s a paper was written and this was an observation but it was published that if you expand the maxilla, you will see spontaneous uprighting of the lower dentition. Mm. And so mm -hmm. because of that paper, it's written and it's taught in the ortho programs, you don't need to do anything to the lower arch because the, the lower arch will follow. Mm -hmm. uh, if it does, it's probably so slow that I've never noticed it. I was getting um, ready to say. If we're, if we're trying to rapidly expand that upper arch, <clears throat> if I get to here, I don't want to throw this patient into a full buckle crossbite. I need to upright the lower teeth in order to keep going. So and that begs fact, the question, two... what, what percentage of the time do you combination expand the top and do lower uprighting? Probably 98%. That's what I wanted you to say. Hmm. Because again, I, I like a, I like a green <laughs> with people. Yeah. That just makes you feel better, right? I mean, right, I know right. my orthodontist is listening to this But this, is, this, a, right this is a change, though, because we have big. had orthodontists in our, even in our airway study club that are just kind of getting into this world, and they will say, just kind of make the statement, you don't need to do lower because it's going to automatically... Auto, auto. Uh, yeah, and, and that's not the case. I think we need to go back well, and ask if, one question, though, because we, we talked about tongues and everybody's, you know, like the autocorrection of the tongue and all that um, is, is a great thing. But one of the questions that it keeps coming up on our comments section here, and I think it's worth addressing before we move to the next uh, set here, is what if the tongue can't move, meaning that it is attached Right. Mm -hmm. So speak yeah. to that and, and what you see as far as tongue ties. Sure. So we see it all the time. And uh, the the anterior tongue ties are probably more rare than the posterior tongue ties. For those that aren't familiar with this language, there's there's two sorts of tongue ties that we'll identify. There's the part portion in the front that moves up and down or that allows the tongue to move up and down. And then there's the dorsum of the tongue. And so that's what we would consider the posterior tongue tie. The anterior tongue ties are often caught early because of breastfeeding, speech, and eating. The posterior tongue ties, you often get a lot of compensations. And so moms can maybe make it six to eight months about a breastfeeding before they give up. Um, now I will say with a caveat, the, the, there's a lot of reasons why breastfeeding might be difficult, but one thing that we, often see with our patients with posterior tongue ties is breastfeeding was not successful. Mm -hmm. um, what the posterior, what the dorsum of the tongue does is it comes up into the roof of the mouth and it allows for that full range of motion of the tongue. And if we think of the back of the tongue, the dorsum of the tongue is what's in the pharyngeal airway space. As that tongue rises, it gets out of the back of the throat. So there's two things that can open up the airway. Number one, 
um, making room for the tongue. So those are those patients that autocorrect. If you make space, um, the tongue will fill that space. The issue that you address though is if it's tethered. So a few things are important to note. Number one, um, they, they don't have the ability to move that up and forward. And the other issue is that the muscles have never been trained to move that way. And that's a really key component here. So for example, if we expand and, and we do a tongue tie release, we have no reason to believe that that tongue will fill that space because it has never done it before. Uh, the patient, this young person, has never learned to move their tongue up and forward. That muscle memory has never been developed. A and the breathing patterns have never been developed. And so the way I explain it in the practice, I say this is physical therapy. Mm -hmm. um, your tongue or your child's tongue has never learned to move in these ways before. And, and everybody can appreciate the concept of physical therapy. I, I often say, do you know anyone that's had a hip replacement, knee replacement? Similarly, what we do is we expand first, we create this new oral volume, then we do myofunctional therapy, train these habits, then we do the tongue tie release, and then we continue with myofunctional therapy. And I stress the importance of the 48 hours after the release because mm -hmm. we've seen many times where it, it scars down. Mm. So um, this is all explained from day one before we start the expansion. And, and this is very much a interdisciplinary treatment plan. The, um, the, the, one of the controversies in the orthodontic world is um, the orthodontic community was concerned that orthodontists were out there saying things like, I alone, me, the orthodontist, I'm going to cure sleep apnea. And, mm -hmm. and that's not true. Just like in um, a comprehensive restorative plan, everybody plays their part. So we need the sleep physician, we need the ENT, we need the orthodontist, we need our restorative colleagues, we need tongue tie release, we need myofunctional therapy, and we all need to work together. Um, sometimes we need allergists and we need occupational therapy too. So it, it's very much an interdisciplinary treatment plan. Hmm. And I think that's that again is it kind of removes a lot of the controversy because that's that's not the goal here uh, to, and I think that those those words a lot of times were were spoken from like a business standpoint almost you know more than a healthcare standpoint, mm -hmm. and I think when we start thinking about this from a healthcare standpoint, it becomes very clear very quickly that you can only do so much uh, well and that you have to have a team. Talk a little bit about because in the white paper. Um, you talk a lot about appliance design for children when you're talking mm -hmm. about these adolescent cases, these younger patients. Um, and, and, you know, we kind of were heading down that path a little bit, but speak to that as far as how, how can orthodontists uh, choose the best appliance and, and how do you make some of these d treatment decisions? Sure. So early, early kids, two, one, two, three, four years old, we look at reasons why they're mouth breathing. We try to address those issues, whether it's allergies, asthma, tonsils. Um, we tend to not do tongue tie releases that early because we want to make sure they can do the myofunctional therapy. Those are great cases for myomunchie, for myobrace, really as a habit trainer. Um, in my practice, I usually give them at cost just because I, I think that it's a tool, but I don't think that it gives us the expansion that the companies tout. Um, by five, six, seven, we move into our fixed appliances. My workhorse for me is a Hyrax expander. I think there's others out there that love bonded expanders. Uh, I tend to use bonded expanders for vertical growers, and that's because we get full occlusal coverage. So it, we get a little bit of intrusion, and we get control of the vertical dimension. A new appliance has come out, which is really exciting, and that's CAD CAM bands. So we no longer have to place separators. We no longer have to fit bands. It's all designed for us by our lab and it's an intimate fit when we cement it. So for the young kids, it's a scan cement and it, it's hmm. very, very easy from a workflow perspective and it's a quick and cementation. That's, and, that's, and that's called what? I'm sorry. So those are called laser centered uh, or laser laser centered bands. There's a handful of labs okay. in the country that are doing them. Uh, they're a little mm. more expensive, but the fit is just awesome. Um, mm. And then for our 
for our late puberty patients, that's when we start thinking about TAD expanders. And the reason for that is the suture is much more intertwined. And especially when we think about airway, we're getting a much bigger effect at the sutural level and up into the nasal passages. We see a lot more secondary tipping with a toothborne appliance in an adolescent and certainly an adult. For our adult females, um, TAD expanders are phenomenal. They're, they're, we have a very high success rate. For our adult males, that's when we start thinking about some sort of surgical intervention. And we think about dome today. Um, we think about SARPI when there's a double crossbite. Now, I want to back up just a second because I think, you know, initially I think we were overzealous and we thought we might get to adult treatment. I think we need to come back one more time and talk about adult treatment specifically because it's, it really warrants, I think, its own discussion. But um, back up this just question, a moment John. to TAD expanders on, yeah. you know, the, the you said something about the suture being intertwined. Let's, for those mm. who maybe haven't taken courses on this or don't, you know, have the familiarity with this, doesn't the suture fuse, mm. right? I mean, this is the common thing that people will ask is, can, is that possible? How, what are you talking about? Don't you have to do surgery in these patients? So kind of introduce the idea of why mm. that's, is that, is that not true? And, and, and mm. who is that not true on? And, and how do we approach that in the adolescent patient? Can I share my screen again? Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let me get to my other talk here. Okay. Uh, so um, in this, this, so the maxillary suture in a one-year-old, it's it's pretty wide open. Ten-year-old, it's more intertwined, and it just keeps getting more and more intertwined. And so uh, as we age, that we get an increased resistance to our maxillary expansion. These these pictures are taken from a paper that did um, a high-resolution CT scan, and you see here, and this is a ten-year-old male. So I want to show you these pictures here. Um, so this, this is a 10-year-old male. Notice the suture opens all the way to the back and goes all the way up into the nose. If we now compare that to a 16-year-old, look at what happens to the nasal passages. We still see the diastema, so clinically this will fool us. We'll think, oh, we got the diastema, we had a success. But if we're thinking about airway, look at what happened in the nasal passages. So we have a lot of secondary tipping. The other thing I want to point out is it's it's all the maxillary sutures. So here you can see, and this is why it improves nasal breathing, but there's this suture as well. There's the zygomatic suture, um, which runs right here. And so we're influenced, and, and I want to point out too right here, if we start using toothborne appliances on um, late adolescents, the resistance at the suture level is so great that we could cause periodontal problems. Mm. Because what we'll tend to see is we'll see a lot of tipping as a secondary byproduct of our expansion if we're not able to open up that suture. So just sort of looking at that side by side here. Mm. And then once again. So so mm. the suture is not as we maybe once thought or as at least those of us who were trained in this area, uh, were th we thought, well, the suture just you can't do anything with it once you get to a certain point. You're showing here that you can, but you have to be aware of the increased resistance as the patient gets older, um, that you can have more of a tipping response if you're not careful. Um, so what is the kind of time when you would m move over toward TAD expansion mm -hmm. in the adolescent patient? What types of cases, is it case selection based upon you know, the, the, the anatomy, is it the age? Is it the, is it the, the, the gender? Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. Um, if it's an airway patient, so if it's a kid that has airway, significant airway issues, difficulty with nasal breathing, um, and or diagnosed sleep apnea, we'll be more likely to think about a TAD expander as soon as they're into the permanent dentition, because mm -hmm. that, that's uh, pretty much correlates with puberty. If it is, if we look at the parents and the parents are tall and the kid is small and it looks like there's a lot of growth potential left, um, I might go for a Hyrax expander, especially if, if there's not an airway complaint. Mm. Um, once we get into late teens, so 14, 15, 16, we're thinking TAD expander. Mm. Um, certainly 20 year olds, TAD expander, and then beyond probably 25, 
to 30. For a male, we think about some sort of uh, surgical intervention, and then certainly um, um, 40, 50, 60 male patients were thinking surgery. Yeah. And what about but the we literature have some... as far as, oh, go ahead, go ahead. I'll let you go on. Oh, first. I was just going to say, maybe we'll come back and we'll talk about SARPI, DOME, and TAD yeah, I think, expanders. Yeah, I think that's what we're going to do is we're going to have to break this up into segments because it's so yeah. good. I want to ask this it last is. question as we kind of close out the show is there's a lot of thought around, you know, when you do, there's literature that's a support that when you do expansion at certain ages that you do get an anterior, posterior dimensional change. At yep. what point does that happen? And at what point are you looking at this and saying, that's not going to happen because of what, right? So elaborate mm -hmm. on that as we kind of close the show here. Sure. Well, I think clinically we do see the maxilla come forward a little bit, pr pretty pretty routinely. Um, if Now, I'd love to come back on the show and I'll show you guys some cases where we're we're trying some pretty exciting things by running elastics from a TAD expander to try to, if the thought is if that maxilla opens up, why not run protraction and get that maxilla to come forward in a minor class three case? And, mm -hmm. and we're seeing some really great results. Um, so I guess to answer your question, we, we see it, we see it quite a bit and there is literature to back that up. Mm. Other people so, have seen that too. So are you, at, at what age do you say, well, this is just not going to happen. You're not going to get much anterior, posterior change. Or do you say, right, because one of the things that came out that Greg and Bob were talking about is that now we're looking more beyond just transverse, and this does get into another mm -hmm. subject, but we are looking at this mid-face deficiency that is so common because the maxilla never came forward. So what looks like a class three is really not a mm -hmm. class three at all. And so if you're going to kind of say, a, maybe not a blanket statement, is just say, you said, well, we're going to use elastics to help change that, right? At what point is there an adult age where you say, we might get a little bit, but we're not going to get a lot. You might need surgery. Yeah, I think that opens a whole new a whole new discussion maybe we can That's come right. back and talk about the <laughs> see AP that too. was why i asked it yeah. because it's a teaser for the next show yeah. right there you go <laughs> That'll be the next show. and and i and i just want to maybe say too and kind of closing this too because a lot of the the, the questions that came up last time about literature mm. support when we talk about the tad expansion you're showing these cts you are mainly focused on the suture but maybe close out by just saying how much volume change are we seeing in the nasal mm. cavity? Um, do we have literature to back up that this type of expansion is making a significant difference in these adolescent patients in, in terms of uh, nasal airway and volume? Well, I think that this is so new that we don't have a lot. I, I will tell you just from conversations with Dr. Juan Moon, who's down at UCLA, that he's on the verge of publishing this. So. Mm. I will say clinically, I see it routinely, but the amount is variable. Um, he has grad students helping him to measure hundreds and hundreds of successful TAD expansion cases. And he's um, publishing, if not has already published, um, case, case reports and studies looking at changes in nasal volume. So that's coming. Yeah, and I saw that he's just got a textbook that's, uh, that's right. just kind of hot off the press, right? That uh, he's starting to get out there. Talk I saw a little that. Bit about I want a copy. Close. Yeah, I know, right? Nobody's, it's just out, I think. Yeah, I'm sure you'll be the first to get the copy. Um, but uh, as, we, as we close the show and respect your time as well, um, mm -hmm. talk a little bit about, um, you've got some exciting stuff uh, coming up at Spear. You mentioned that's launching soon. Talk a little bit about that and also, um, I think you, you're doing some some more in-depth courses on these decision make this decision making for appliance design. Talk a little bit about where people can find out more about that stuff. Yeah, so it's a it's a really exciting time because I think people are interested in learning about this. Um, the course we're putting together at Spear is going to be so unique and so fantastic. It's it's two days. Um, Mike Gunson and myself are talking about skeletal growth patterns, pattern recognition. Um, and surgery as well as early intervention. And then the second day is going to be uh, Dr. Jim Janikiewski and Greg Kinzer talking about 
interdisciplinary treatment planning. Um, if, if there's anybody out there that really just wants to dive deep into skeletal growth and development, um, just because I was encouraged by some friends to put this together, um, I put together a two-day course in Seattle on skeletal growth and development, and there's a hands-on TAD expander component to that. Um, I'd love to welcome anybody to Seattle if they want to learn about it. So there's, we're, we're trying to get this material out. We're trying to share this. And certainly when it comes to a comprehensive education on airway, I think SPEAR education and the, the, the material that's, that's being interwoven in all of the um, course material is pretty exciting from Warren Dentition to, of course, Jeff Rouse and all of his courses and workshops. And um, Greg is incorporating it. Everybody's incorporating it uh, because it affects us on all levels. Awesome. This has been fantastic. And Rebecca, mm -hmm. if you'll just hang on the line just for a second here and we can maybe set up our next show before you go. If you have a hard stop, we understand we'll catch up with you later. But I really appreciate Rebecca being on the show. And as we kind of close this out, I want you to think about how you might connect with uh, Rebecca and Spear Education and the Dental Guys. And the way people find out about this type of information, it's really... You know, you have to do a little bit of digging, as John and I found, but here's the good news, is that now we have a place where they're trying to put all of this together. And I remember a couple of years ago, whenever we interviewed Rebecca, and she says, man, you guys are asking the right questions, and we're putting together those protocols and those systems. You heard some things today that were next level and were systematized. And I know a lot of you commented in the section Below, I saw some comments of like, you love the way that she systematizes things, and that's the way John and I like to practice in our in our uh, local practices here. And, and so here's what we're going to do is we're going to recommend that if you have to reach out to someone, you can leave a comment in the section below. We'll see if we can answer some of those questions. We might not get to them all because I know there was a lot, but we're going to try to try to dive into that over the next few days. Um, if you want to, to reach out to Spear, one of the greatest ways ways that you can do is you can head over to Spear and, and subscribe to their online education right now because there is more content just like this from all of the Spear faculty members. It is crazy what they're doing over there. And then the dental guys on our side of things, we're going to try to bring on Rebecca again and do another live stream and we've been we've been kind of pairing up with some of these uh, spear faculty members we're looking to get greg and bob winter on the show the greg and bob shows we've always called it so we look forward to that so how do people find out about the dental guys hey like share and subscribe find us on facebook leave us a five-star review on apple itunes and any podcast listener that you catch this will be releasing this in an audio format later on as well so thank you so much for listening again this has been another great episode so for rebecca for john I'm Wes, and we are the Dental Guys.